Hi, and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future, and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. Did you know? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Jade to the Future and on YouTube as Jack to the Future. Follow me to get behind the scenes info, access to the previews about my next episodes and much, much more. On this week's episode, we're talking about the future of English. I'm joined by Simon Horobin, who is a professor of English language and literature at the University of Oxford. We talk about how English could be combined with other languages in the future. We discuss whether emojis are actually real words. And I share with Simon my favourite types of words, which are spoonerisms and portmanteaus. And I quiz Simon on his knowledge of slang words. This topic is so interesting. There's so many things to think about. For example, how many people speak English in 2050? Will English take over other languages in the future? What do you think? My friend that says English is like Lego, built of lots of different pieces and different shapes and sizes. I like that. If that's true, then English will carry on building and building and its future is never ending. After doing a fair bit of research for this topic, we found on the British Council website that basically it's a really hard topic to predict as it depends on so many things, like why you're learning another language, what your home or native language is, travel, business, war, technology, all sorts of things. Grown-ups who are experts in learning about language think that more people will speak more than one language in the future. And so it's unlikely that English will take over. And in fact, languages other than English are already starting to make up a lot of the information you can find on the internet. For example, 19.8% of people using the internet use Chinese. Well, Mandarin specifically, and it seems to be the language getting more and more popular in the world. I love English. There's so many things to discover about it. I love learning about the history of words, how they came to be, and what ways they can be used. What is the longest word that you know? I know one, but it's not a real word. It's supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. The longest word in the dictionary in English is 45 letters long. It's supposedly a lung disease. I'm gonna have a go at saying it. Pneumono, ultramyscopic, silly, coval, panico, gnosis. Pneumono, ultramicroscopic, silico, volcano, coniosis. I think I did a pretty good job. And that's the other interesting thing about language. How it's written isn't always how it's set. And that is fascinating. Language is fun, isn't it? But it can make it complicated when you're first learning to read, write and learn. It seemed appropriate to start this episode with a game, so I've got some riddles for you. Okay, first of all, what five letter word becomes shorter when you add two letters to it? Did you get it? The answer is the word short. What four-letter word can be written forwards, backwards, upside down and can still be read from left to right? Noon. N-O-O-N. Bet you didn't know that one. And the last one for you. This last one is quite an easy one. What is the end of everything? letter G. How did you do? Riddles are really useful to improve your language skills. They can help you learn about the multiple meanings of the same word. They force you to think outside of the box. They improve your vocabulary and spelling and grammar and make you think about the letters in words. But most importantly, they're fun. Before we wrote the questions for Simon, we read an article he'd written in the language magazine about the future of the English language. Mum will put the YouTube video and article link that Simon was involved with in the podcast description. I'd like to welcome my special guest, Professor Simon Horobin from the University of Oxford, who teaches English language, literature and medieval literature. 
Hello. Hi, Jack. I hope I got all that correct. Spot on. Thank you. I saw a video of you on YouTube and you're talking about how English might be mixed up with other languages in the future, like Spanglish, for example. Can you tell us more about this? Sure, yeah. So English, of course, today is a global language. So it's spoken all around the world and it's growing all the time. So there's people like us that speak English living in England, but there are people speaking it, of course, in America, where it's for many people their first language. But it's also for many people their second language. And that's true in other parts of the world. So in India or in Asia, where we see lots of people who are learning English as a second language or even as a third language. I know that you're learning some French at the moment and you're hoping to go on and learn other languages as well. So, and that means that in those different cultures and societies, they're using English in different ways to us. And that often causes it to change. So you might mix it up with other things from your own language. That could be that it's taking words from a language like Spanish and introducing them to English, but it also might be to introduce different pronunciations and sometimes introducing changes to grammar as well. And what that is often resulting in is a kind of mixed language. So Spanglish is a good example of that. It's a language that began its life as a sort of mixture of Spanish and English. But for many people now, it's actually becoming their first language. So it's the language that they learn as a child from their parents. And so we then have to wonder, it, does that mean it's a mixed form of Spanish and English? Or is it a language in its own right? Is it now becoming a separate language? And people differ in how they would see that. So some people would say, well, that's that's just a mixture of two languages. It can't be its own language. This is what we're seeing around the world now. There are lots of mixed languages, Chinglish, Japlish, Denglish. And so one way in which we might think about English in the future is that it's kind of sort of breaking up into lots of other languages. If we go back in history a long way to the language that the Romans spoke, Latin. Well, nobody speaks Latin as a first language still today because Latin sort of broke up at the end of the Roman Empire into lots of other languages, what we now think of as French, Spanish, Italian, and so on. And so we might be seeing a similar thing happening with English around the world. Mm, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I heard some people speaking in different languages just generally, and I usually hear them like, Oh, that sounds interesting conversation. I wonder what that means. And then suddenly I hear an English word like the word, I don't know, like brother or a word like that. And, and I was a bit interested to hear what they were going to say. One thing is that languages borrow words from other languages all the time. So, you know, English is full of words that have come from other languages throughout history, particularly from French. But because they often go back to you know, hundreds of years ago, we don't necessarily notice that they're French today. So people, colour, for instance, you know, these are actually borrowings into English from French. So sometimes we might think it goes the other way because we recognise words in French and think, oh, they borrowed these words off English. Like the word entrepreneur. Well, yeah, that's a good example of. So later on in history, we borrowed an, a lot more words from French. And sometimes we've actually kept the pronunciation. Entrepreneur is a good example sounds a bit more French, doesn't it? It's more obviously a French borrowing is what we call it in linguistics. And there are lots of words like that. And we're still borrowing words all the time. But other languages are borrowing words from English too. But sometimes that's a bit controversial. So in France, for instance, there's an academy that was set up in the 17th century, the Académie Française, it's called, French Academy, which was designed to ensure that French was kept pure, because they believed that we shouldn't borrow words from other languages, especially from English. And it was corrupting French. And so if there's a new concept uh, that comes into French society and there's no word for it, rather than borrowing it from another language like English, the academy has to come up with a new word. And then that becomes the official word for people to use. The only problem with that, of course, is that language doesn't really work like that. People use words whether they are told they can or not. You know, language is something that we just use it. We don't really always have to look a word up in a dictionary to decide if it's the right word or not. Maybe if it's something you're doing for school, or maybe if you want to know how to spell it properly. Yeah, yeah I think that's okay. So for instance, do you know the word hashtag, Jack? 
Yes. In French, when Twitter started becoming a big phenomenon and people started using hashtag, they called it hashtag in French. But hashtag. the French Academy did not like that. And so they decided that it should be called mot dièse, mot dièse. But people who are on Twitter, again, don't really want to be told what the official word for something is. And quite often these English terms are considered to be quite cool, quite authentic. And so people just refuse to use it. So you can set out rules for language, but not everyone will abide by them. Now, of course, when you're in school, you started spelling words however you wanted and using all kinds of slang words, for instance. Your teacher might start getting out the red pen and underlining them and, and crossing things out and so on. Because, of course, there are correct and right ways of using English. And that's one way in which people might be critical of a language like Spanglish, to go back to this idea of mixed languages, saying actually all that's happening is you're corrupting the language, you're using it incorrectly. And so there are some people who think that we should be trying to keep English in that way by just making sure people abide by the rules and that the language otherwise is changing. Mm, yeah, I'm coming on to slang language later on. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> I don't usually use it. One time in a lesson, my friend asked, how do you spell because? But they just said cause. And then, mm. and then the teacher said, that's not how you write it. But I think that's okay to use sometimes. That's a good point I think you've made there because there's a big difference between how we speak and how we write, isn't there? Especially if it's something that you're doing in class. So it's probably quite common for us to say cause when we're speaking, especially if you're speaking really quickly, or if you're speaking to your friends when you're a bit more informal. But when it comes to writing it, you have to spell it out the long way, don't you? Yeah. Sometimes you can say, for example, them, you say them, or you instead of them, you say mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. No. Not so um, you. So. Yeah, you, for pronoun you. I said that writing is different to speaking, but specifically writing, if you're writing for your teacher or doing your essay for your homework or whatever but when you're writing sending a, a text message or when people put things on social media quite often they don't think oh I need to spell this out fully they're more representing the way they would speak it's more informal isn't it so they might represent their accent they might just abbreviate things because they're trying to do it really quickly and they don't feel there's a need to conform to all of those rules and that's another way in which language is changing today and it might change a lot in the future because technology changes language and who knows what the new technologies you probably know better than me jack what the technologies are going to be in the future but they're going to change the language as well because we adapt it to that way of communicating mm, yeah i think that's just lazy <laughs> mm -hmm. what's your favorite spoonerism or portmanteau do you know what that is i do yeah Oh, that's a hard question. So yeah, portmanteau. It's well, another term for a blend. What two words that have been joined up together? Maybe you know, a banana and a pineapple. A binapple. Yeah, yeah, that or, would work. Banana. Yeah, a banana. <laughs> yeah. So portmanteau. Do you know where that word comes from, by the way? I think it's it goes back. Well, portmanteau is actually a type of suitcase. It's a very old-fashioned suitcase. And one way you put all your stuff in one side and then in the other, and then you join the suitcase together to do it up. And that's why this is like two words that have been joined up together. It's actually the word was invented by Lewis Carroll, who wrote the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And he was particularly fond of making up portmanteau words. How long ago was that? It was about 150 years ago in the 1860s. Wow. And yeah, in it, there's a poem called Jabberwocky. Have you come across yeah, that? Yeah, yes. I know it's very, very famous. Yeah, and he has lots of made-up words. So like chortle is one of the ones that he invented in that. As in when you yeah. laugh. That's right. It's a blend of chuckle and snort. And that's my favourite portmanteau. But he also oh. does galumphing and slithy. And he says in one of his poems that he wrote, there's a word frumious, which he invented in that way. And he explains in that that the word frumious isn't, comes about by setting out to try and say fuming and furious at the same time but you don't decide which one you're going to say before you start so you say them both at the same time and out pops the word frumious and that's how he invented it oh, that's good i like that one what's your I, favorite i think my favorite portmanteau 
is ah uh, yes well my sister is very hungry she gets angry at the same time we call it hangry hangry that's a very good one isn't it yeah i think we all get that sometimes yeah <laughs> my favorite spoonerism is car park i know it's not a real word but if you swap it around it's a oh. car park i used to say it when i was three or five years old i used to actually think it was that <laughs> that's a good one I like that. Do you know where the word Spoonerism comes from, incidentally? It's actually, there was actually a man called Spooner who was so prone to making that mistake that they decided to name it after him. And he actually was was the head of an Oxford college just down the road from where I teach in Oxford. This is about 100 years ago. He was in charge of it. And he used to say these things to students. Like, for instance, he would say, you have hissed all my mystery lectures. And what he meant by that was that you've missed all my history lectures. And then all the students would burst into giggles and he thought he was telling them off, but actually they all laughed at him. And then he'd say things like, you have tasted the whole worm. And what he meant by that was... Wasted the whole term. Wasted the whole term, exactly. It sounds like you were eating a worm. Yeah. And sometimes he have to, he'd have to go into chapel and announce what the hymns were because he was in charge of the college. And he'd say, the next hymn is, the Lord is a shoving leopard. Can you work that one out? Yeah, the Lord is a loving shepherd. <laughs> that's right. And everyone would fall about laughing again. And that's why they called them spoonerisms. It's funny enough that what you were saying about park arc when you were little, that's quite a common thing for children to do when they're learning the language. And again, that can actually end up in... the the language changing. And if we go back in time, the word wasp, buzzing insect that can sting you. When that word is first used in English, it was actually wops. But it's actually quite hard to say wops. And so people started saying wasp. And eventually, because enough people do it, then it changes. And so if enough people went around saying park arg, in the end, that could become the word. Or sometimes, you know, the little star that you sometimes see. Asterix. Exactly. Asterix, you said. But it's actually, did you know it's actually an asterisk? So the word is actually asterisk. I mean, it actually means little star, but most people now pronounce it asterisk. And so it's another one of those ones that's sort of in the process of changing. And so maybe in the future, if enough people say asterisk, that will change and that will become the word. Because although you might think, well, that's just people getting it wrong and they need to learn how to get it right. And that may be what will happen as well, because if you wrote that in your essay at school, the teacher would probably say, no, it's actually asterisk. That happens a lot in the history of English over time. Yeah. Do you think acronyms will replace a real language in the future? For example, IDK. Do you know what that is? Um, I'm guessing it's I don't know. It is, yeah. It's I don't know. Or maybe LOL. Yeah. Yeah, so I think they're growing all the time, aren't they? And again, we've touched on this, that they are more common in the new technologies that we use all the time. It means that speed and shortness is definitely a benefit. It's so much quicker and easier to type out IDK than write it all out. But if we tried to speak in using acronyms and only acronyms, it might get a bit confusing. Because there's so many words out there, so IDK, that could stand for something else. So yeah. you might get confused with the different words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I remember when LOL, as you've just said, started being coming quite common and widely used there was a case when the prime minister at the time david cameron had famously used it in a text message thinking that it meant lots of love but not realizing that it actually meant what you said laugh out loud and so that's the kind of thing where it could be quite embarrassing if you get that wrong couldn't it that would be awkward and so i guess that there's that problem with it it's so compressed that it might be tricky and in speech It does sound a bit odd as well, doesn't it? So some of these have become sort of words, haven't they? Like LOL starts out as as that. And now we might say lol. And you could also say, you know, lols. It's sort of like a plural or could actually become a word in its own right. So that does happen. But I imagine it's quite unusual. And sometimes you think of them as being quicker and shorter to type, but they're not necessarily quicker and shorter to say because WWW is a sort of acronym for World Wide Web, isn't it? But it actually takes longer to say www than it is just to say World Wide Web. Some words have started out that way. You might not realise they did. Do you know where the word radar comes from? Because that's actually, that is an acronym originally, but you just wouldn't know it now. So it stands for Radio Detection and 
ranging. Why is there two A's in it? Oh, because radio, R-A. But yeah, you're right that it's not exactly how a acronym works. So it's a bit of a cheaty one, but it is where the word actually came from. But it's just that once it starts to be used as a word, you don't think of it as an acronym necessarily anymore. And there are lots of suggestions that words have begun in that way, but that it's often not true. So the word posh, it's often thought that that was began life as an acronym standing for port outward starboard home and it was to do with the idea that when people went on ships to go to India they used to get the best cabins if they went on the port side on the journey out and then the starboard side on the journey home and that they would have their tickets stamped p-o-s-h and that was where the word posh came from but there's actually just no evidence that that is the case just a nice story so it's not actually true no no I'm afraid not and another example that you may know, do you know the word bae? B-A-E. It's a kind of slang term for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And it's sometimes explained as being an acronym because it's supposed to mean before Hotel. anyone else. It's your friend. It's your best friend. You like them before anyone else. But actually, it's probably not from that. It's probably just an abbreviation of the word babe. Yeah. So people think that these words have started as acronyms, but actually the acronym comes afterwards. Um, that's what we call a retronym. It was made up later. And I think, you know, the technologies that we use now mean that we're using more acronyms than we did in the past, but I don't think they're going to replace language. Do you think emojis are words? Huh, that's a difficult question. I mean, in some ways they are a bit like words, aren't they? In that they represent something concrete in the world. So a picture of a dog is a bit like the word dog. It's not quite like it because, of course, the word dog is made up of letters that you can sound out the pronunciation from it. E-O-G. Whereas the picture, yeah, whereas the picture represents the actual object itself. It doesn't tell you anything about the pronunciation. And of course, it, it's not tied to any particular language. So if you could send a picture of a dog to someone who didn't speak any English and they'd still know what you were talking about. So emojis are good thinking about the language of the future. You could say, well, why don't we just all communicate using emoji? Sometimes the word the, there's not really emoji for that. So exactly. you might just That's skip it out. Good point. That's yeah. a really good point, because that's one way in which emoji is not like language, because you could say it's very like language. We could all communicate using emoji and then we wouldn't have to go out and learn Spanish and German. And, you know, you could skip all that, just learn emoji at school and we'll all just talk in emoji. But what emoji lacks are some of those words like the or that. is exactly. And these are quite important words, aren't they? Yeah, I think emojis mostly are used for feelings and verbs. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely right. One of the things that emoji has developed to do is to allow us to communicate in writing, but by trying to convey some of the things that we would normally convey using our faces, our hands, our tone of voice, our intonation, the kinds of things that when we're in a face to face conversation, we smile, we wave our hands around, or we might be sort of looking sad or angry, or and it's difficult to convey all of that in a text message. So emoji are really good at doing that, but they're not so good at explaining more complicated, more abstract ideas. So it's light language, but it's a much more restricted kind of language. You couldn't just communicate an emoji, could you? You would immediately start finding, oh, what's the symbol for this? Or And people have translated the whole of books into emoji. But when you start to read them, you realise it's actually quite difficult to understand yeah. exactly what they're doing. And you, you have to know the story first, really. Yeah, I think the same. You could make up new emojis for different <laughs> words, but that's probably just a waste of time because you'd have to go, the people who decide to make um, the word an emoji. Yeah. I guess on yeah. phones and technology, you can design your own emojis. So there is an emoji dictionary that will tell you what all the different uses of emoji are. But it's a bit like if we tried to make everything acronyms, then it would be a bit confusing because we wouldn't know what all the acronyms stood for. Might be a bit the same with the emojis. There are loads of emojis, faces and things that I have no idea what they're supposed to be. And if you think that there's a need for an emoji, you can write to them and say, this is the emoji I think we need. Um, and people do that all the time. They keep adding new emojis. But you're right that the idea of going through the whole of the Oxford English Dictionary trying to come up with an emoji for every entry would be quite a big project. <laughs> That's one for you for the future, Jack, maybe. Yeah. Interesting, though, have you ever studied the ancient Egyptians? Yes, yes. We were doing um, hieroglyphics the other day. Yeah, and, hieroglyphics. Um, yeah, That's an example. Like squiggly of lines, there's pictures of birds and animals. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was just thinking of the way in which hieroglyphics works is it begins with the idea that you have a picture that illustrates 
the object itself. So as a writing system, it started life in that same sort of way that you were describing when you have a picture to say the thing. But what it then developed into is the symbols represented the sounds rather than the object themselves. And that's what developed into the idea that you have letters to represent sounds that we use today. And you only need 26 letters or thereabouts to represent different sounds. So it's actually quite a good system, even though obviously there are limitations to it. Mm, yeah, yeah. Do you know what a mordnilap is? An imordnilap. No, you'll have to tell me. <laughs> really, this can be quite confusing, but okay. it describes a word that reads as another word when spelled backwards. A mordnilap is the word palindrome spelled backwards. And if my listeners don't already know, a palindrome is a word that reads the same whether you spell it forwards or backwards. Mm. It's not a very easy word to say, a mordnilap, is it? No. I know another word for that. Have you ever come across the word levidrome? No. It was invented by a six-year-old Canadian boy. He was driving along with his mum in the car and they got to the lights and there was a stop sign. And he noticed that the stop sign, if you read it backwards, said pots. And he thought, that's weird. That word can be a different word if you read it backwards. And he asked his mum what the word for it was. And she said, I don't know. And when they looked it up, they couldn't find a word for it. So he said, it's a bit like a palindrome. And I'm called Levi. Let's call it a Levi-drome. And then he made a sort of campaign to try and get this word into the dictionary. And it got lots of coverage in the media, but it still hasn't actually made its way into the dictionary. It'd be nice to have a word named after yourself, wouldn't it? Yeah. But the problem is that you then have to get loads of people using it. And of course, we don't talk about ordinary laps and Levi drones every day. Yeah. Um, and also he needs to get everyone around the world using it, not just people in the area that he like, lives. I like that one. I'm going to try and use it more. A lot of the programmes and channels I watch are American, and sometimes I find myself using American English, like saying trash instead of rubbish. (laughs) I use that quite a lot. Do you think American English will take over in the future? Well, it's definitely having an influence, isn't it? Just as you say, and I suppose it's the younger generation particularly influenced by American English. Partly, I guess, because of, you know, as you say, YouTube or watching Netflix and watching American films. My kids always say, I'm going to watch a movie, which to me sounds very American, but to them, that's just the, the normal word for it. And of course, the young generation is actually the future of the English language, isn't it? Because it's your generation, Jack, that's going to be the people who are going to be speaking English in the future. And so I can imagine that the influence that you're talking about now, that will change English in the future. But I guess it sort of tends to be individual words, doesn't it? I don't know if you find your accent is being changed by listening to American films. Do you say trash or do you say trash? It still sounds English, even though it's an American word. And in a way, we are all being influenced by popular culture. And a lot of that is American English. But it's not always so straightforward because, for instance, the word cookie is what Americans use instead of the biscuit that we would use. But of course, we do have cookies, don't we? we? But we maybe think of them as being sort of bigger, chewy chocolate chip biscuits. So that we use the same words, but maybe in slightly different ways. And so is that American influence? Or is that just that we've got these particular kind of biscuit and we use the American word for it? And of course, because English and American English are, go back to the same language, sometimes what we think of as an American word so like you know what the americans call the season autumn no you know the word for that fall because it's when the leaves fall off the trees oh yeah they fall and we call it autumn but actually in england we used to call it the fall in terms of the biggest influence on us when it comes to our language is more people that we talk to every day in our families and our friends so that while you probably are influenced by the YouTube videos that you watch, you're more likely to be influenced by the people that you hang out with at school or, you know, your friends. Yeah. Now I'm going to do a little quiz, if that's OK. Mm-hmm. So you know the meaning of these slang words. So number one is salty. Oh, salty. Is that sort of um, if someone's being quite rude and difficult? And... Oh, that's very, very, very close. Because it's kind of the same. It means bitter, angry and agitated. Oh, OK. Salty. That's a good one. I can imagine I could use that a lot. 
I used this next one. <laughs> so really, quite a lot. Yeet. Yeet. Yeah. That one. It's when you throw something, you get something and you just chuck it away. I see. That's... You could yeet it over here. Maybe. Or if you just like jump, like jump quite high or I don't know, do something active and kick something or spin around or, or the force of something. And then flex. Hmm. Well, I'm thinking that because you can flex a muscle and that is a way of showing off your muscles, that this yeah. might be something to do with showing off. Yes, it is. The answer is to show off. Ah. Good. <laughs> and this is the last one, Shedder. Well, I do know what Shedder is, but I'm thinking it's not going to be the answer you've got there because my answer is to do with cheese. <laughs> so um, no, I don't think it's that, is it? No, it's um, money. Money? Yeah. Okay, so you could say to somebody, can I borrow some cheddar? Yeah, can I borrow some money? That could be confusing, couldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people would be like, oh, I don't have any cheddar, because they didn't like cheese. I don't like cheese. Yeah, that is very confusing. Or if they did have some cheddar, they'd just give you a block of cheese. <laughs> um, my mum actually didn't know any of that. I, I did better than your mum. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for telling me everything today. And my favourite bit was basically everything because English is one of my favourite subjects. That's great. Uh, at some point I was exploding with knowledge. There were so many things about English going on in my head. Your brain really will be exploding with knowledge when you've done all of these. Yeah, I think it might be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 That's all we've got time for today. I've had an amazing, incredible time talking with Simon today. And so many new things of how words formed, where they came from, what they're going to look like in the future. I can't wait to tell my teacher of some of what I've learnt. My favourite part was when we were learning about portmanteaus and spoonerisms. Did you learn anything new? By the way, Simon has written a few books that are really interesting. To start with, I'd recommend the one called The Very Short Introduction to the English Language. He also did a talk about it at Google, which is available on YouTube. Mum will put a link in the description. Remember though, if you have a child listening, make sure that you go on the internet with a trusted adult to stay safe online. Join me next time for another exciting episode of Jack to the Future.